Okay, guys, you think that we have talked about everything hormones on this show? Well, I have news for you. Betty Murray is going to drop some bombs on you today. Just eye-opening studies, eye-opening pieces of advice for you all surrounding hormones and how a woman's hormones change in menopause, which of course we know, but very interesting pathways that are involved, very interesting things that she found during her PhD research that can make a huge impact on your weight loss or weight gain during menopause and even perimenopause as your hormones are changing. So this is going to be a game changer for you. And you can probably hear the excitement in my voice. The latest introduction, the latest member of the family to the fixer line is metabolism fixer. And this, oh my God, I formulated this just for all my people out there that need to lose weight, that need help in the weight loss department, that can't lose weight no matter what they do, that feel like they have a slow metabolism. And that might be thinking of trying all those peptides out there. You know, the Beverly Hills soccer mom drug of choice for weight loss peptides. Or even if you're on them already and you're like, man, these are really expensive and I'm still not losing weight, add in metabolism fixer. Here's what I did. I took the power of T2, which increases your basal metabolic rate while you are sitting there watching Netflix. You're burning fat while you're watching Netflix. I combined it with a very unique patented ingredient called Suppressa. Suppressa has multiple clinical trials backing its efficacy in reducing your appetite, decreasing snacking, and providing way more control over your food intake. It is amazing. We also see improved emotional well-being, just decreased food cravings all around, reduced hunger, and weight management. Add on top of that, we have green tea extract, we have purple forest purple tea extract, both of which affect the metabolism in a very positive way without the jitters of normal fat burning supplements out there from the 1980s and 90s, right? The ones that made you feel like you're having a heart attack. You will not have that in any of my supplements, thyroid fixer or metabolism fixer. But metabolism fixer, oh yeah, we kicked it up a notch. It is in powder form. So you can drink it through your day. It's going to flavor your water. We got orange crush and refreshing citrus. I love them both. It is going to keep you under control all day long. So you throw a couple scoops in your water bottle in the morning, throw a scoop or two in your water bottle throughout the day. You will have fat burning and appetite control the entire day for what? An eighth of a price of the peptides? Oh my God, you can't go wrong. So grab some metabolism fixer today. Please let me know how you do on it. I am super excited for you. Super excited. So let me tell you about my friend, Betty Murray. She is just absolutely amazing. She's passionate about transforming the lives of women who struggle with menopausal weight gain, insomnia, and fatigue. And I know that so many of you out there, she has witnessed firsthand through working with thousands of women and her own struggle, of course, that's how we normally get there, that women struggle with balancing their hormones and they don't have all of the information that they need to take control of their life. So her transformative the coming into our own project is a lifestyle brand designed to empower and enrich women's lives so that they can be the empowered leader creative mother, sister, daughter, and partner that they want to be. Betty was honored to be among the first 300 certified functional medicine practitioner with IFM, the Institute for Functional Medicine in 2014. She is a pioneer in this field. And she's also the host of Menopause Mastery Podcast, which I was on as well. She's just amazing. And you have to listen because we're so much alike. She was into bodybuilding in her 20s, just like I was. She got into really lifting heavy shit, just like I tell you all to do, just like I did. So this is going to be a really fun, fun podcast, but it's going to be super eye-opening for you, I promise. So go ahead, dive in, and implement, implement 
what Betty is saying to you because small changes are going to make a big difference in your body. Betty Murray, thank you so much for joining me. We have been planning this out for so, so long. And I really, really wanted your your brain on my podcast because the way that you look at all things, I mean, the way that you look at weight loss and fat loss and, and menopause and perimenopause and hormones and even what you're studying with your PhD is just, it's going to be different. So I'm telling the listeners right now, this is not going to be your typical weight loss, hormone talk, Betty's going to drop some bombs on you that they're going to shock you a little bit. So Betty, thank you so much for coming on. I can't, I can't wait for this discussion. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited to have it. All right. So you and I were talking off air and I totally agree with you on this point that, you know, we talk so much about weight loss because let's face it as women, that is forefront on our minds. When we are gaining weight, when we can't lose, when we don't feel like ourselves anymore. That's what we think about. And so we immediately go to Dr. Google and we listen to 5,000 different podcasts and get 10,000 different pieces of advice. So can you break this down? Just start somewhere and then let's just talk about weight loss and what you see. You know, let me start with what I think is kind of this overriding sort of my mission. So myself, you know, I would say this was true for me and definitely true for all of my clients, the women that follow me on Menopause Mastery, is that often, because we don't like our vehicle, my butt's too big, my boobs are shaggy, my belly's too fat, you know, or all of those together, all the stuff that we pick ourselves apart about, that most of the time, particularly when we enter into this time period of life, I'm 53, so I'm at this, you know, next season of life. Often we have like these underlying dreams and desires, or I want my life to look like this, feel like this, be this, or I, I want to go paint, or I want to do whatever it is. But what I kept hearing was, as soon as my vehicle, my body looks the way I expect it to, or when I, like I felt when I was 20, when I felt great, then I will do this. You know, then I will take on this next adventure. And I was like, okay, my, my coming into your, your own project and, and all of this was like, no, we need to kind of do these things simultaneously. And I think women have the unique opportunity and, and will change the world. We just have to get out of our own way. And so what I think is so important is, you know, you touch on this all the time too, is that we have very important hormones like the thyroid that, you know, the thyroid hormones direct kind of the engine of the body and what really happens. But these hormones are a symphony and you can't extract one and just address one without looking at the others. And when I got, you know, kind of my own little story with this, you know, I, I came to functional medicine for multiple reasons, but the biggest one was I was diagnosed with colitis, which is an autoimmune digestive disorder, extremely disruptive to your life and obviously not fun to have, you know, and I was able to get my colitis under control with dietary change supplementation. But the other thing that happened is, you know, I was in my late 30s, I was coming off birth control, I had had my tubes tied. And, you know, I had a thyroid problem took forever to get diagnosed and properly treated. But, you know, I, I had all these other issues with my hormones. And I'm seeing all these, you know, very well meaning and very good functional medicine people. And by the time I hit 40, it was like the wheels came off the bus, I started having acne, I started, you know, I, I, I started having even greater mood changes. And, you know, one of the things I asked the doctor before I had my tubes tied was, will that change my hormones? She goes, no, oh, not at all. We're just going snip, snip on the fallopian tubes. Well, I, I do think there was a profound change, right? You know, and, and but at the time, it's like you weigh it against having a period every 20 to 21 days. I was like, right. I can't, can't really handle that anymore. And I had an ablation at the same time. So, you know, for me, there was this symphony. And you and I both came from like living kind of a bodybuilder world where you, low carb, high intensity workout. I loved that environment. So I knew how to do low, low carb. I knew how to lean out, yep. you know, in my 20s and 30s. But when I hit 40... Man, I was doing all the right things, and there was so much junk in my trunk. It was just like I could not, like I, over the course of a couple of years, gained about 30 pounds, 35 pounds, could not get it off through my 40s. And I tried on different hormone replacement, this and that, and it was like something was really broken. 
And, you know, honestly, working with clients, I shied away from talking about weight loss or working with weight loss. And it was kind of resounding in the building. I didn't want to see people with weight loss because I'm like, how the F could I be talking about that when I can't fix my own metabolism? Mm -hmm. So I went back to get my PhD for multiple reasons. I was already reading the literature and I'm like, well, I just need to drop another couple hundred thou and and, and get another. Why not? But the other side of it is I wanted access to the research. Right. Because if you wait for what's going to get published where people can see it, you're 18 years behind. Yeah. And that's when I really started digging and I started really finding all these things that were happening, particularly because of these wild changes in our sex hormones, estradiol and progesterone specifically. And and it, it, and it was really that that I started putting those pieces in place for me. And lo and behold, I was able to lose 35 pounds. I couldn't lose for over a decade. And I've been able to keep it off for almost four years without having to starve or be 100% low carb keto, whatever it is. Right. You know, that's so restrictive that somebody's going to lose their mind and, you know, go pig out because they can't handle it because they're starving all the time. You know, there's just so much out there that's messed up. And I'm excited we're going to talk about it because because I think there is a subset of women that are struggling in this arena doing all the right stuff. And it's because this information isn't, you know, readily available to everybody. Absolutely. And and I think women tend to grab a hold of whatever they see. And I'm guilty as much as anyone of I do focus on let's fix your thyroid. Let's address insulin resistance. These are the keys to weight loss. But it's easy for us to give generalized advice to our listeners. But then when it comes to really working one on one with someone, you can dig so much deeper and you can really get nuanced with their their hormones and really see what they should and shouldn't be doing. So I'm so happy that you're bringing up that it's not just this. It's not just take some supplement and take some thyroid medication and go keto. It's not that's not the only answer. There's so much more to it. So let's dive into that. Which direction would you like to go first? Do you want to start with Estrogen, because I know you're like an estrogen queen. There's a lot that we don't know about estrogen and what it does. And even as women go into perimenopause and menopause. So you tell me which which hole you want to go down first. Yeah, well, let me, I'll, I'll kind of back up and make sure that we're all t- kind of talking about the same thing. So, you know, menopause is really a process. But in the West and conventional medicine, menopause is a single day in your life. Like if you go to your doctor, all they're thinking is this is one year, one calendar year from the last time you had a period. Yeah. But that transition change, that perimenopausal season, when we start to feel all those symptoms like sleep problems, mood changes, weight gain, you know, hair loss, you know, libido changes, all of those things, that season on average is a decade, which means, you know, it's a bell curve. So on one side, for other people, it may not be anything at all. Or they might have a couple years. And then on the other side, they're two decades. So I was pushing that two decade mark, you know, Mm -hmm. and And it really is this loss of hormones. Well, there's some things that happen that we know in the literature. So on average, after 20 years old, we lose 5% of our metabolic rate for every decade. So, you know, so we have this, what I would say is natural aging. It's, It's a condition of growing older and the body aging over time. It is natural, but it is not ideal and not guaranteed, right? So there is this natural sort of slowing of the metabolism. So you look at it and go, well, why would we have slowing of the metabolism? Because men don't experience that in the same way. Right. They have a slow decline of testosterone, not like us, we cliff dive. Mm-hmm. You know, so what it really got me looking at was the impact of estradiol, which is the main hormone uh, that our ovaries produce, uh, the one that has all the protection, and it's progesterone and estrogen and estradiol that fluctuate throughout the month that allow us to ovulate, allow us to, you know, get the egg in the uterus and allow for implantation and a fetus to grow. So it's, it's really these fluctuation of these two hormones that cause all those symptoms. And then when we lose estradiol, all of a sudden, all the protection of our hormones are gone. So once a woman goes through menopause, we age match men for heart disease. We are more likely to have osteoporosis, muscle mass loss, stroke risk, and then we have a higher degree of dementia risk. So those hormones, specifically estradiol and progesterone, are protective to us. 
So when I started digging, I, I found some some information in the literature. So I'm going to get pretty geeky about what yeah. happens inside okay. the cell. Mm-hmm. So, so we have our powerhouse inside the cell, the mitochondria. And the mitochondria not only burn energy like, you know, your glucose and your fat for ATP production for energy, but it also produces things. So for instance, the mitochondria in the ovary produces estradiol. So when we start to see this loss of estradiol, What's really happening is we've got a couple different things that happen inside the cell that are part of our protective mechanism. Like you and I talk about, you know, having reverse T3 as a protective mechanism outside the cell to sort of block that thyroid receptor because we we as humans have had a lot more time where we've been in a starvation state than a plentiful state. So when we look inside the mitochondria, there's, there's some switches that happen in there. And so one of the first things that I found, and it was actually Dr. Rick Johnson's work at a University of Colorado and his team, and it's now been repeated over and over and over again, they started looking at animals that hibernate, all right? So bears, squirrels, and they have a controlled mechanism. So in the, in the wild, animals don't get fat unless it's a controlled mechanism, Right? So in hibernation, a dog, animal that hibernates, they have a controlled mechanism to gain fat so they could sleep for three or four months and burn their body fat and stay alive. And so, you know, other than our domestic animals, my dog's a little fat at the moment. Because <laughs> so, we're, when, when we free feed them and do stuff, we make them fatter. But animals gain weight in a very controlled manner, and they have a very controlled manner in which to lose it. So even if we force feed farm animals you know, they will automatically lose it and go back to norm. Mm -hmm. So inside the cell, the mechanism that allows the body to gain fat is driven by a switch. And and it's a, it's a, it's a something that we can even test in a lab called uric acid. So uric acid is a byproduct inside the mitochondria of the cell that go up when there's damage to the cell or damage to the RNA. So think of it, your powerhouse inside your cell got attacked and somebody, you know, beat up some of the generators in there. So they're not working very well. So the cell says, gosh, I can't run on full steam. I'm going to slow the engine down, right? So anything that raises uric acid inside the cell is going to slow your powerhouse. And that's every single powerhouse in your body. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is there's research out there showing that women, as they go through menopause, lo and behold, oddly enough, we have an elevation in uric acid, automatic sort of happens. Everybody thinks of uric acid as something for gout, right? Right. Because if you get too much of it, it builds up and causes a toothpaste-like buildup in joints and it causes pain. Mm -hmm. But we know that uric acid being high in the serum is causative in hypertension, causative with heart disease, causative with weight gain, damage to the liver, NAFLD, which is fatty liver, and all these other things. It's not that it rides along with it. It plays a role in the action of it. So I started looking at that. I'm like, okay, uric acid, high, bad. Women go through menopause, uric acid climbs. So not only do we have a higher risk for gout, but what else do you think is happening? The powerhouse just moved to half mast, right? So, so the first thing you want to remember is that your mitochondria are going to slow. Even if you turn on the thyroid, like if you can get the thyroid receptor working, yes. But inside the cell itself, that powerhouse is going to run slower. Mm-hmm. Now, I would love to see if they had any, you know, T2 research to see, does it have any interplay with uric acid? That'd be interesting. Yeah. Sorry, we had to get geeky there for a moment. Yeah, yeah. I'm going I'm to write that down, look that up, actually, see if there's any studies on that, because that way I, I can totally see the tie-in. Right. Like they, they might coordinate because, mm-hmm. again, this is a survival mechanism. Yep. Okay. So uric acid climbing inside the cell is a survival mechanism, and the mechanism actually helped us as humans make it through an ice age. That was a genetic switch in the uricase enzyme that allowed us to survive an ice age, or we wouldn't have humans on the planet, period. Mm-hmm. We would have died out. All right, so that happens. And then there's a, there's a pathway called the polyol pathway. And I actually just did an entire episode on this because it's so geeky. But this is an alternative pathway that your body uses to help you conserve and have another fuel source instead of glucose. So essentially what the polyol pathway does is it takes glucose and changes it into sorbitol. And then sorbitol gets moved and changed into fructose. Okay. So I have fruct- not heard of this. This is fascinating. Okay. Yeah. yeah that, that's, this is another like I'm up at three o'clock in the morning reading this and going, what? Oh my gosh. Why is anybody talking about this? So the sorbitol pathway is this alternative pathway. Okay. Now we know in diabetics, and insulin resistant people, people with metabolic syndrome and obesity, this polyol pathway is amplified, right? So it's where we have this conversion aspect happening. So fructose does not metabolize in the same way that glucose does. 
So fructose bypasses insulin control. So insulin is sort of this shuttle that picks up glucose from the intestines and shuttles it to the cell. So we have this very controlled way to make sure that we keep blood sugar levels normalized through the use of insulin, but that we also control how much gets shoved into the powerhouse to burn. Mm -hmm. So fructose bypasses that and it goes straight to the liver and gets metabolized into fat more frequently and more easily. So it becomes body fat more easily. It also gets stored in the liver and causes fatty liver. So we have an increased fat storage and it slows the liver's function. But when fructose hits a cell and it's going to get pulled into the mitochondria, so we have the capacity to bring it in and use it as fuel because it is a secondary fuel source when food may be scarce. When it gets pulled into the cell, your body uses it as fuel. But what it does is radically drop the production of ATP, right? So your main molecule energy has now dropped by 50%. Okay. So, so you get some energy, but it's not very good. And so we have this, this sort of backhanded effect that, that the polyol pathway is going to amplify the slowdown of the powerhouse. So lo and behold, what else do you think is amplified with the loss of estrogen in the powerhouse? So wait, do we also have then, so if we're losing estrogen, obviously we're losing testosterone because that's, since testosterone aromatizes to estrogen and we know perimenopausal and menopausal women have that steep drop off of testosterone is that the next to go absolutely you know so so now and it's going to be amplified in your muscle tissue right which is your main main burner like if your muscle tissue is insulin resistant you are not going to be able to burn fat it's just you can't you can't right right? so so if we're converting you know a, a lot of things into fructose so we're going through that process or if i'm eating fructose in high levels like high fructose corn syrup or even i don't know having a skinny margarita made with agave which is all fructose all fructose you know, so we might be having that or chewing gum made with sorbitol well that's what i was going to ask you when you brought up sorbitol i always think of it as a sweetener as as one of the sweeteners that they put into food products. I never thought that it can actually be a byproduct in our body. Yeah. Yeah. And and sorbitol shows that it has this mechanism. Urethritol, xylitol do not. Okay. At least from what we've seen in the research, but sorbitol will. So those people chewing the sugar-free gum and they're chowing on a sorbitol gum all day, that may be part of what's going on. So here's where it gets even more interesting. And this is Rick Johnson's work. It's not mine. But the other thing that they showed, okay, so we have this fructokinase enzyme that allows us to do this is his group showed that if you are mildly dehydrated, okay, mildly dehydrated, the carbohydrate content that you're eating or the glucose circulating in your bloodstream will go through this polyol pathway and become fructose. Okay. I'm going to drink some water right now, Betty, (laughs) so that I'm not dehydrated. (laughs) So, so what does that mean? So, because again, this is, you got to think of it. These are survival mechanisms. So our bodies are designed to look at anything like dehydration as starvation because we need water before we need food. We've got plenty of fuel left on us and body fat, but we must have water. And so dehydration is going to drive this conversion process and drive fructose up. Your powerhouse is going to run at half mast. Everything's going to be slow. And if you're eating, like, like let's say, so pasta, like a gluten-free pasta is going to be mostly glucose, which is a better fuel than something that has a higher fructose level, right? So you're better off doing that than doing a, let's say, piece of cake where you've got table sugar in it and other stuff. But let's say you're dehydrated and you go into that gluten-free pasta meal. You might as well have had ketchup with high fructose corn syrup because your body's going to convert it. And that one was like a game changer to me. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> wow, how bad is that? Now, of course, depending on how somebody's wired genetically, as humans, we have this, but some of us, they, we can tell, have a more hair trigger response. So as women, uric acid's going to climb, we're going to have more of a slowing of the mitochondria, and then we're also going to have this polyol pathway potentially amplified. So, so those are two ways in which your mitochondria are completely changed just by the loss of estradiol. Because estradiol, when it's balanced, helps us be leaner as a young adult. When we have too much, usually in our 40s, because progesterone has already declined, Mm -hmm. it can drive some insulin resistance and cause weight gain, like we see in polycystic ovarian syndrome, where there's a very high level of estrogen and a very high level of your androgens, like testosterone. So it often leads to weight gain. Mm -hmm. But, But again, the loss of it makes everything worse, too. So you don't want too much or too little estradiol, 100%. Exactly. So there's another switch. And so when we bring glucose into the cell, so we have the first, the first doorway insulin has to sort of push it across the wall. 
And once it's in the cell, we have a transporter that takes glucose and pulls it into the mitochondrial area so it can go into the mitochondria. It's called the GLUT4 transport. And it's very heavily represented in your muscle tissue. And it's a passive transport. So I like to think of it as kind of like, you remember as a kid that game shoots and ladders? Yeah. You know, and so you get to the chute and you can slide down to the end. So it's, imagine you have like a ladder that's just got a very slow tilt. So you kind of, you kind of roll, but it takes a while to slow down and and it takes forever to get to the end of the slide. Well, that's kind of how GLUT4 works. It's not an active transport. So it's not like somebody passing it to the mitochondria very quickly. It's this slow sort of ooze into the, into the mitochondria. Well, the GLUT4 transporter goes to sleep when we go through menopause. It's our ability to actually use GLUT4 is significantly impaired when we lose estrogen. So now, so now our fuel is sitting out there in the cell hanging out. And then if I'm making fructose, my fructose is going to often get burned in the campfire outside the powerhouse in an anaerobic environment. And we're going to build up lactic acid. And we're going to be driving a 1984 Yugo rather than a brand new high-end Tesla because our engine is running slow. So the other thing that happens is when that fructose is damaging the, the mitochondrial activity, we burn in a campfire that is going to put out some heat, but not much. Right. You know, and so it's all from this like fluctuation of estrogen. And then the last thing that I found is we have, I think people, we recognize that there's things going on with hormones, but one of the major hormones is epinephrine. And epinephrine is both a neurotransmitter and a hormone. And it is the active transport to get fat from the bloodstream into the cell. And our nerves need to bring epinephrine to the fat cells, especially subcutaneous fat. So most of us hate the junk in the trunk and the jiggly bits, right? right? And as women, we put more fat on on the outside of our muscle than we do inside, like in our abdominal area in general, because of the way estrogen affects that activity. But our nerves have to bring that epinephrine, so the, the basically the stimulant to tell the fat cells to dump it. Well, that activity in the central nervous system declines rapidly in menopause. So the electronics to get your fat cells to sort of dump out the fuel into the bloodstream and let adiponectin sort of move it into the bloodstream is diminished. So what that all means is your muscle tissue is your biggest stuff to burn, right? So we have to be moving. We have to keep the body physical. We need to do that. The ability for the muscle cells to use glucose is significantly impaired because of loss of estrogen. The powerhouse runs at half steam because uric acid is going to be elevated. And I could potentially be using fructose as a separate fuel source and also burning in the campfire instead. And my nerves that are going to my jiggly bits aren't pulling the fat out of the jiggly bit area. And I'm still mad because I've got junk in the trunk. Wow. Okay. All right. So I have a couple questions to really break this down so we can understand it. I know the listeners are going to have this question pop into their heads. But fructose is fruit, Betty. And fruit is good for me. Shouldn't I be eating fruit? Doesn't that help me lose weight? So where does fructose actually, and and beyond just fruit, all the forms of fructose, we kind of know that high fructose corn syrup is bad. At least most of my listeners know that. But what about the natural sources? Should we be staying away from that as well? Right, right. So, So think of fruit as nature's candy. So up until really the last two decades, you couldn't get strawberries all the time. You couldn't because we didn't have a global food supply that allowed you to you know, fly those with frequent flyer miles from Fiji or wherever we're getting them from. So take the bear, for instance. What do bears eat in the summertime so they can hibernate in the wintertime? Remember Yogi Bear and all the other bears? They eat honey, eat fruit. Anybody that lives in an area where there's bears, like don't leave out anything sweet in your trash because they will trash your house to get it Mm -hmm. because they are drawn to those foods that help the body put on fat. So fruit is nature's candy. And obviously we have some like bananas and pineapple that are higher in fructose or higher in sugars than others. But a small amount of that is not going to trigger it. But I've even had people that had gout to eating a cup of fruit a day just because they had probably a hair trigger response to 
this. Mm -hmm. So depending on how you're wired, it could be part of the process, right? So the amount of fruit you eat may be leading to that. Now, I'm not saying don't eat any at all, but you know, you might need to check how much you're eating and stick to the low glycemic load fruits like berries, you know, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, right. apples that aren't really high in that. But then we have all of the honey, the high, you know, the uh, agave nectars and all these other natural sweeteners that don't cause a, a rise in blood sugar because they're bypassing that activity, right? Fructose doesn't transport in the same way. Right. You know, so we're getting it in stuff. So a lot of people are getting it in, oh, I don't know, ketchup, marinades, other food sources. And I think the most insidious thing is people might be eating, let's say, let's say you're not gluten free, but you're eating whole wheat bread. And you don't realize that the second ingredient is high fructose corn syrup because it's a preservative. Right. So there's, there's all these other places that it may be hiding in your package and even your packaged gluten-free junk food, right? Um, what else is really interesting, and, and I think Rick Johnson's work didn't necessarily show this, but there's all these other foods that can raise uric acid, right? So we have alcohol, organ meats, red meats, food additives, MSG, texturized vegetable protein, hydrolyzed autolyzed yeast and all the flavor enhancements. And so those things also do that. So there could be beer, beer and wine, especially beer. That's why they call it a beer gun. It's not just the calories in it. It's the amount of yeast that's left over, which is a high RNA product that our, our mitochondria see as damaged mitochondria and it raises uric acid, not only in the bloodstream, but it's kind of the same mechanism. Mm -hmm. So I think that some women have a more hair trigger response to this. And then they're going to see these wild changes if they're eating foods with these things in it. Some of the other things that we think about that are healthy, cheese, if you're a cheese eater, aged foods. So olives, charcuterie, you know, your, your umami foods, soy. You're or if you're all the good stuff. Yeah, all the, you know, anything aged is going to have a higher level of these. Rick Johnson's work didn't necessarily point that this was very high. But again, remember, research studies are done on a bell curve. So you're going to have people that may not be statistically significant in the general population, but there's outliers on each side. What I think, and this is just my opinion, I have not found it in the research, I think some of us have a very strong hair trigger response to these mild changes in uric acid that do this up and down. Because I'll tell you, you know, up until reading this research, like my favorite idea of a meal would be something that looks like a tapas thing. I'd have some olives, I'd have some avocado, and then I'd have some, you know charcuterie or, you know, bacon's great. You know, I would eat, if I could, I would eat those type of foods all the time. I am driven to foods that taste like that. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, is what if you're a saltaholic? I love salt. You're mildly dehydrated. You get ready to eat. Even if you're eating healthy, you're triggering the switch. And especially if you eat salt, because salt is managed at the kidneys and it's all part of that protective mechanism for dehydration. So even being a saltaholic, you better go into it well hydrated. So if you are, I am, Anybody that see me, they're like, I can't believe you do salt. I need it for my adrenals. But if I'm going to have a salty meal, I'm going to drink a ton of water beforehand to make sure I dilute it. Wow. Okay. All right. So we need to stay hydrated for all functions. I mean, if we're talking about losing the extra junk in the chunk, you have to stay hydrated. And you've heard that before. Water helps you burn fat. Now Betty has just explained pretty much the why behind it. So we need to stay hydrated, drinking a lot of water before a salty meal, possibly cutting way, way, way back on or eliminating fructose, cutting way, way, way back on the high uric acid foods that you just listed. So what do people do now? So what do you do with people that say, but Betty, now what do I eat? You're telling me I can't eat red meat or organ meats or olives or cheese. I'm trying to be low carb here, but you know, I can't have bear. What the hell do I eat? <laughs> right. You know, so, so again, there's this, our body wants homeostasis, right? So it wants balance and there's hormetic stressors. So our body's using these different stressors to sort of keep getting back into balance. So, you know, when I did this and I kind of did it on myself and it's sort of the basis for my hormone reset group is often, it's kind of like why you would go with somebody with a thyroid problem and insulin resistance, right? Mm -hmm. That you may need to go very low carb and we may need to pull out these highly aged foods and the umami foods while I'm doing that. So I'm forcing the body to take those stressors and, and basically shift the foot off the brake, 
right? Often once we do that and we sort of get the feedback loops fixed, meaning so the body has to see it, you know, see things change in order for it to then turn around and make something else. And so often we have to sort of force this. So we take a little bit of a sledgehammer to the process early on so we can get, get movement, right? So in the very beginning, I might take out all those aged foods and the soy sauces or, you know, the no soy or the coconut aminos and those things. And I may reduce all those things out to just make sure that, the, that we don't have the foot on the brake. Because often, even if somebody exhibits insulin re- resistance sort of behaviors, but their labs don't show it, this is the mechanism I think is happening. And so once we are able to do that and we get the body kind of going, okay, I'm going to turn the powerhouse back up. The next thing is to create metabolic flexibility. Right now, because this mechanism has been going on, we'll burn carbs, we'll burn fructose, we'll chew up muscle and use it as fuel, because there's another step that happens too that we can talk about, but we can't burn fat very well, right? And so we have to, have to teach the body how to go between those macros so it can burn all of that. And so I use a lot of different kind of intermittent fasting and other things and carb ro- rotating and all these other things to sort of help the body do that. Mm-hmm. Because most of the women I see that I end up working with, they're doing all the right things. They're like, I'm low carb and I've been that for forever. I'm doing hit. I'm, do- I'm doing all the right things. And nothing's moving. Right. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is probably the mechanism. That is fascinating. Okay, so at least people can bring back in a couple, maybe not all, but a couple of their favorite foods once you get this pathway straightened out, once you move them into more metabolic flexibility. So you had mentioned, which just freaks me out a little bit, burning muscle. So we can actually get into a state where our bodies are chewing up our own muscle tissue. Absolutely. So again, all of these are sort of mechanisms for us to survive a, you know, a situation where we don't have enough fuel. So we have certain cells in our body that must have sugar. So like red blood cells have to burn glucose. So our body has a mechanism in which to keep that blood glucose level balanced. And same thing with the the brain, the brain's preferred fuel is glucose. Without it, you better be a damn good fat burner and have plenty of ketones because the brain will starve, which is often why going low carb, especially in the beginning, is so difficult because the brain's going to feel it acutely. It's like, oh my God, where's my fuel? Mm -hmm. Right? So our body's mechanism in which to do that is a thing called gluconeogenesis. So essentially what's happening, we got big words here, is your body takes amino acids, which are your proteins broken down, pulls them into the liver and the liver converts them to glucose to help maintain at an active level of blood glucose level, right? So if you weren't eating, this is going to get amplified. In my head, I kept looking at it and going, you know, one of the things particularly Amy and I can both speak to is, is people that are in the bodybuilding community, which bodybuilding is one of these things that's great because you can manipulate the body and you can get lean and all this other stuff, but it's also brutal because it is sledgehammering your body to get into a particular shape that's not really designed to do. No. But one of the things that almost always happens, particularly to the fitness pros, is their metabolism is super screwed when they're done. All of them will say, I have thyroid problems. I can't lose weight anymore because they did all these really brutal things to their body again and again and again. What I thought when I started looking at it, because I'm like, oh, I kind of did that stuff to myself, not knowing I was young and dumb. Same. Right? Yep. And so what I think and what the research is kind of alluding to is that this process of gluconeogenesis is amplified in women. And when you go look it up in the research and you say, well, you know, what happens with menopause? Lo and behold, gluconeogenesis, the conversion of basically amino acids, your proteins broken down, in the liver to glucose to fill the need for fuel is amplified. So again, your body may not be choosing to burn fat because it's just going to go make more glucose. And what I think is happening is for a lot of those women, the liver is doing that because the liver is where all this dysfunction is happening. And we're losing that estrogen at the receptors inside the liver. And then we're losing all this capacity for our body to use things properly. So you could be eating a lot of protein and you may be directly doing that instead of, instead of burning fat and you could be doing all the right things and your body's chewing up muscle tissue to, to break it down to make glucose out of it. Wow, that is fascinating. Is there a protein half? Because I've talked about gluconeogenesis before on the show, not extensively, so we can definitely kind of dive more into that because a lot of people that go keto or that do carnivore for long periods of time will consume so much protein that they will not lose weight and they're wondering why and it could come back to 
this gluconeogenesis process that occurs. Is there a cap on when this is all occurring in menopausal women? Is there a cap on how much protein you like to see women eat so they don't push into it? Or can this happen even with the women that are maybe only consuming 40 to 50 grams of protein per day? So I think it's a, you know, I I can't say that I can point to the research and go, this is a clear path, you know, because again, nobody's really looking at it. Because quite frankly, the medical community doesn't really care about women's health. Up until the 90s, we were left out because of our pesky hormones. And even today, they just are kind of like, eh, you guys are sort of like hairy men, (laughs) longer haired men. What I think is occurring is I would say in general, the people that are eating below, you know, 70 grams of protein a day are under consuming period, end of sentence. It's not a, they're going to chew up their their muscle mass. We need protein. It is essential. Carbohydrates are not essential. Fats are essential. That means our body must operate on them. But I think when we do the majority of our caloric intake, and, and I know you probably did some, you know, 200 grams of protein a day while you were that. lifting. Yeah. yeah I'm, you know, you're at the point where I like even today, like a protein shake, I'm just like, I got to be starving to do it because I had so much protein every day that I think, I don't know what that threshold is. I wish I could nail off the threshold and say it's this, but let's say you're doing 200, 250 grams of protein a day because that's your caloric intake. At some point, your body is going to be doing gluconeogenesis. It has to, especially if you're carnivore. So I think there's a threshold. And again, I think it's probably some people genetically don't hit that threshold. The rest, some of us do. So if you're doing carnivore or you're eating major keto and it's not working, there's something not working for you. It's just not working for you. So, So yes, if we are overeating it in this extreme amount for a period of time, I think it does do it. And then if you're under eating, I think there's definitely problems. There was some research done and off the top of my head, I can't remember the name of the researcher that's been driving this, but he's basically spent his entire life looking at protein metabolism. And what he found was, is that in most cases, particularly as we age, we need about 120 grams of protein a day. In various sources, it doesn't mean it has to all come from animal, but the most important is that we get basically methionine, lysine, and, you know, and all of those proteins, isoleucine, are the, they're the three most important because they are vital to function with the DNA and everything else, but that we need about 120 grams of protein. But what I found really interesting is there's this dividing line as we get older. And what they found in their research was that if we say, okay, 120 grams of protein, when we're young, we can trickle it in a little bit at a time. So we can have a little protein bar, then I can have a little protein shake, and then I could have this handful of nuts. And I can eat six times a day and sort of dribble this protein throughout the day. Where there's a first pass metabolism to the liver. So a lot of things kind of hit there first before it goes elsewhere. Well, what they found was when we start hitting our 40s and 50s and above, if that bolus of protein is dribbled in, it goes through first pass liver activity. So what I think is happening is some of us are probably doing gluconeogenesis on it. Mm -hmm. But if you did the bolus in a high amount at the morning meal or whatever the first meal is, it breaks your fast. And the evening meal or your last meal of the day, that it actually goes to muscle protein synthesis because you're giving enough to go past the first pass metabolism in the liver. Right. So when I heard that, I was like, oh my gosh, I've never heard that before. If anything, up until this moment, everybody was like, oh, eat, you know, four times a day and protein spread out is good. So what I started doing with my people is I'm like, I want your breakfast and I want your dinner to be 45 grams. And then what you do in the middle doesn't seem to be as important, at least from his research, because again, if we get enough, and especially if we've been lifting weights and doing all these other things, it'll go to muscle protein synthesis, which is the building of muscle tissue, which is what we need. Right. And there was a time where I had a trainer that had put me on 200 grams of protein per day and I gained weight. I mean, I remember that blow up because at the time I didn't know any of this. I didn't even know the term gluconeogenesis. I was in my twenties. So I was just listening to my trainer and I couldn't figure out, wait a minute, I'm training hard. My carbs are low. I'm in that training cycle, you know, the gym twice a day, all of that. And everything was so regimented, but my protein was so high. I mean, I remember that I blew up and could not even figure out the why. And now we know the why. Now there's, there's a a really funny guy, but he is a brilliant dude, researcher, Lane Norton, Dr. Lane Norton. And he, I I love him. I mean, I agree. I'm going to have him on the podcast. I agree with some stuff. I disagree with some stuff. It's going to be fun. But he basically says that there's not necessarily a cap 
for how much protein our bodies can absorb at one sitting. Because as you and I know, being in the bodybuilding space for so many years, we always heard, yes, you have to break it up into four to six meals per day. No for women, no more than really. I mean, what I used to hear is no more than 30 grams per meal because anything over that can get pushed into gluconeogenesis. Dr. Norton's coming in saying, "Mm, not necessarily. And that's kind of in line with what you're saying. If we are going to bolus the protein beginning and end of our day, can we even do more than 45 grams? Like if we're trying to get a woman to eat that 120, which I love that you said that. I love that you said 120 grams per day. How can we do that? Can we have her eat 50 to 55 grams with, at one sitting? Absolutely. You know, because you and I both come from the bodybuilding world. And I have to say, I probably parroted this statement, which I hate when people parrot things and they don't go look at the research. So my, myself included in this, that it was, well, you can't overdo more 30, 30 grams because you just won't metabolize it properly. Right, right. And that's not true. And, and, and that mechanism works really well when we're young and we've got growth hormone and all that other stuff. But as we get older, it's worse. So somebody could do 50 grams in that first meal. Like I have a lot of women that don't want to eat protein. I'm like, okay, so let's put collagen and a protein shake. Let's get all these forms of protein in that first meal so we can get enough. Mm -hmm. Because what we do know is loss of muscle mass and sarcopenia, which is, you know, you could be thin and still be under lean, right? So that essentially, if I don't have enough muscle mass, my risk for all cause mortality goes up, especially as a woman. So we need to hold muscle, we need to keep it. And our ability to build it gets worse with every decade. Mm -hmm. And so we need to hold on to it, which is why we want to hit that 120 grams. So you know, splitting it up and feeding it in, in those two boluses would be fine. And you still could have obviously some at lunchtime. What's interesting is I think when it's kind of broken like that, like maybe the person that's doing really high protein and it's not working or myself at that time, in the beginning, I may drop for a very short period of time, I may drop the protein content down to see if we can just stop gluconeogenesis while we're doing a bunch of other things. So it's kind of this, you know, massively moving gear work, but we do, but usually I'm trying to draw that protein back up. You know, somebody could eat vegetarian foods and get that level of amino acids and proteins, but you're going to have to eat a truckload and chances are you're going to overeat carbohydrate content for your level of activity. And it's going to be harder to maintain body weight or lose weight. You know, you have to do, what, six cups of quinoa to hit the amount of protein, the amino acid composition that would be in a chicken breast. Like, I'm not going to eat six cups of quinoa. Right, right. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, no, no, not at all. (laughs) I'm kind of going to transition into genetics because something that you said just pinged my, my genetic radar of how some people can get away with genetically eating large amounts of carbohydrates. My husband's one of them. He, he's built like a brick shit house, and he can down the carbohydrates left and right. If I ate that bowl of quinoa, I, I, I would be five pounds heavier the next day. I would just blow up just as, and how my body is responding. And I'm optimized. It's not my thyroid. It's not my insulin. It's not, that's just how I respond. So what about genetics when it comes, how, how important is it I know you've been looking into it a ton. Where does that play a role? Yeah, so so genetics, um, I've been working in genetics for over 10 years. I've even had my entire genome mapped, right? So every single gene, I paid the money early on to get it done. It wasn't really eventful and helpful then. I think it will be as we get further and further and further in genetic research. But so what we know is if you look at your ancestors, right? So our ancestors were Caucasians. Our ancestors are mostly Northern European. Our ancestors went through months on end where they chased down whatever they could find. There was no vegetables growing. You might have been lucky and got some kale or some broccoli or something that grows in the winter. But, but we didn't have a high carbohydrate t- content diet during the winter time. Now, if you go to the Fernal Crescent or you go to like an island area where food's plentiful, food was plentiful. They have a different metabolic activity, different set of genes based on their environmental things that had impact on it. So to give an example, there's a gene called ApoA that is influenced by saturated fat. So it it turns on and regulates how much fat gets absorbed from the intestines and how much gets utilized metabolically. So I happen to be doubly mutated on that, which means if I were to do a high fat ketogenic diet with a lot of saturated fat, coconut oil, that kind of stuff, I gain weight rapidly. Of course, I tried it and I was like, oh my God, what just happened? <laughs> hey, there's something to this. <laughs> there's something to this doesn't work. And I also get crazy changes in my cholesterol, right? So it's, it's because again, this is a survival mechanism from my family. There's also one called Amy1 that affects 
how well you metabolize starch. So I won the genetic lotto. I also am doubly mutated on AB1, which means I suck at using carbs as fuel. And I used to joke, and actually you can go back and listen to my old, uh, older podcast. I actually put my own genetic discussion with Kashif Khan from DNA Company mm-hmm. out there for everybody to hear. So you can hear exactly what my genes do. And he laughed because he was like, oh, my God, you're terrible metabolism. I was like, yeah, I've got it on both sides. I was built to conserve. Yep. So those two genes will heavily influence whether you can utilize carbs or fat very well. And then there's the whole impact of estrogen and the, and the genes that affect how we metabolize estrogen that may make things like insulin resistance worse. And those things can be playing a role also. And so even if you're good on the genetics that are just the basics of how you metabolize your macros, you could have other things about how your hormones are shifting that may be making this better or worse. Wow. So do you recommend, and do you do this on your patients? Do you do genetic profiling on everyone? And do you recommend that? You know, I, I, if I had my preference, yes, because it, it, it provides, so it, it tells you the blueprint, right? So if I'm building a house, your DNA is kind of like your foundation. You know, it'll tell you how wide the house is going to be, how deep it's going to be, tell you where the plumbing is. So it'll tell you sort of how you're gen- generally going to be laid out. It's your epigenetics. So it's the house you build on top of it that either makes that foundation crumble or not. So if I'm wired, I joke that I'm wired to be sort of a small 1950s track home, right? So not not 5,000 square feet, definitely not a three-story condo with a pool on top. My genetics are not very well wired for the throwdown lifestyle. Right. You know, I can't party like it's 1999 every day because my body's going to die, right? You know, so I like to know that. Now, some people, it may not be the best thing. If they're terrified of finding that they may have some genetic risk patterns for certain disease, this may not be great. But I look at it and say, gosh, if I know I'm wired poorly for living like Keith Richards, I'm not going to live like Keith Richards. It's going to make me change my behavior. So I think it's advantageous. But I always layer on top of that things like the organic acid test that tell us what the genes are doing at that moment or the Dutch test, the dried urine hormones, because that tells me what my epigenetics are doing. Am I building a condo or am I just doing a single 1950s track home? Right. Well, we were talking about that when we had dinner at the conference we were just at together about gluten and how some people know that they have celiac. Some people know that they're gluten sensitive. And we talked about the genes actually expressing themselves. So one person at our table has the gene for technically being celiac. But then you chime in, you're like, yes, but it's does that gene express itself? So it's not necessarily that we can say, here's this marker in your genetic code. You have celiac. No, it's is that gene expressing it? So can you expand on that even in terms of how it relates to you, your genes, the ones that we you found, the APOE, not four, because I always want to say four. That's tied to Alzheimer's. The OP, APOE one or three? It's, Would you say it's, earlier? Um, it's APOA. APOA. So okay, A-P-O-A. it's not A-P-O-A. APOA. Okay, got it. Yeah, APOA, and then there's the APOE gene that that um, if you carry a version four, you have a greater risk of having Alzheimer's and high cholesterol and cardiovascular disease later in life. You know, I think I think we have to look at genetics and recognize that. You know, so we have good ones, meaning wild type, meaning that they're more prevalent. That's all that really means is, is this particular combination is more prevalent in the population. The mutations are the least prevalent, right? Sometimes they may convert improvements, right? So in some ways they may help you in, in some things. In other ways they don't because our current lifestyle no longer supports what our genetics were wired for. Right. So, so for instance, I carry the genes for celiac and I, and I am a celiac. But as a kid, I freely ate gluten, mm-hmm. right? I had these episodes of digestive stuff, but they were pretty infrequent. And I had long periods of time where I didn't believe me. I pounded some pasta as a kid, yeah, right? I had a pretty healthy appetite. Let's just put it that way. But at some point, it got turned on. Now, the question is, is it, you know, did I get sick with something? Did I have changes to my gut microbiome that regulate my immune system? So your genes often have to be triggered. And it can be triggered from a lot of things, hormone changes, perimenopause, all of that. Once it gets triggered, often it can stay on. So once it's on, now this, this gene has been fired up and our immune system in this particular case is attacking 
the intestines and causing damage in the small intestines or, you know, causing uh, symptoms of gluten sensitivity, non-celiac. So just because somebody have the genetics, they need something often to sort of trigger possibly some of these genes to get turned on that may be disease causing. So I'll give you another example. The APOE gene, if you carry a four, you have a greater risk of Alzheimer's. Well, 30% of the people that carry a 4-4, which is highly, highly damaging, you know, it's, it's like a sevenfold increased risk for Alzheimer's. 30% of people that have a 4-4 don't get Alzheimer's, right. despite having the gene. So what that means is they're doing something that isn't triggering that gene to express itself. So they have that 1950s track home, mm -hmm. and they're living within that track home within their means, and they're not doing crazy stuff to remodel it. Yep. So I think that's what people need to know is knowledge is power. And once you know those things, you can make choices and mitigate a lot of these risks. Absolutely. Beautiful. Well said. Well said. Betty, you have laid down just a ton of information today. I love it. This is definitely, it's not something that has ever been talked about on the show. So it's completely fascinating. And you had mentioned earlier that you have a group so women can actually join and, and have just learn more about this and learn more about how their bodies are working in menopause. So can you expand on that and then tell people where they can find you? Certainly, certainly. So um, you can find out about the group on hormonereset.net. And there I do have a quiz. So the first thing you have to know is obviously these hormones all work together. So a lot of it is figuring out which ones are out of balance because thyroid definitely is there, but it's usually not the only one. And so in this group, this program, what we do is go through this three-stage process that sort of takes a sledgehammer to these different mechanisms to get it back online. And, and it's pretty effective. You know, like I said, for me, it was helped me lose weight for the first time in, in a decade and keep it off, which is, you know, pretty big. Right. And I and I'm not 100 percent low carb. You know, I, I right. eat carbs. I don't have right. to do that. You know, and so you can find that information on hormonereset.net. And if you want to just look me up, if you go to bettymurray.com, you can get to my menopause mastery podcast. You can get to the quiz. You can reach out to my team and, and set up a, a time to talk and find out if this is really for you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, absolutely. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's a great podcast. So I highly recommend subscribe to it because she gives a crap ton of amazing information beyond what we even talked about today. So Betty, thank you so much for your time. I truly appreciate it. It's been great. Thank you for having me, Amy. I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs>